hear us all right. Yep. We're good. <laughs> okay. Pam says you are soft. I'm soft. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you'll have to. All right, well, good morning. I think it sounds like most people can hear all right. Um, we're glad you're joining us today for the webinar. Uh, this is usually where I tell the really good jokes that I'm sure most of you enjoy. Um, I don't. I didn't have a chance to find any today. I'm keeping my good ones for administrator days. That way, I'll leave you guys with a little cliffhanger and make you all excited for administrator days. Um, today, today, <laughs> today with us, we have Deanne Hefner from the auditor's office. Um, Janice Errett, which most of you probably know, and our uh, budgeting team, and Bill Biven on the budgeting team, Jen Hudemark, our state aid director, Tom Geschel, our poverty and LEP specialist, among many other things, and then I'm Bryce Wilson, the director of finance. Uh, <clears throat> if you haven't found the material yet, can you go to the next slide, Bill? Uh, it's all out on our website, the FOS website. Uh, where you can get the slides. That's the top link there on the page. Also, this presentation, when it's done, will be posted out on our website, so you can go back and review. If you had questions or missed something, um, you're more than welcome to go back and check that out. And the slides, will be, we'll leave them up usually for quite a long time, so you should be able to go back and check that out. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please, feel free to uh, type them in the chat box and we will try and respond. Um, otherwise, if you have other questions you want to talk about afterwards, uh, we, as usual, would welcome any phone calls or emails. Uh, we're glad to uh, work with you or answer the questions that we can. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Deanne and she's going to go through uh, the budget update with you to start off with. Hello, everybody. Just a second, technical difficulties. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, some LB updates just so uh, everybody's on the, the page with those in case you haven't heard or you didn't see those. And the first one is LB 151. And this is regarding the, the hearing notice. As some of you uh, that have been around budgets for a while can remember, we used to count five days as the day of the publication and the day of the hearing. And then about two years ago, uh, we got challenged on that by uh, some attorneys and we basically had to change how we were counting those five days. Um, this legislation, uh, our office uh, got introduced last year in order to clear that up and go back to the way everyone was counting it for years. So now you do count four days. You count the day of the publication, but not the day of the hearing is how the four days comes into place. So hopefully that's good news for everybody. And uh, that's a, a yay in that uh, category of LB 151. Um, the next slide, I don't think you'll be saying yay to as much. It was also part of LB 151. Um, it's related to the interlocal agreement report. Um, it, what it does is it changes the day that that report has to be filed. It used to be December 31st, and it changes it to September 20th so that it's in conjunction with the budget forms. And I think that is a good change. Um, I, I think we'll have more compliance with everybody um, if they are, are filling that form out at the same time as their budget. Our office will be looking for that form at the same time we're reviewing budgets. Um, some of this change for this portion comes from um, frustration by state senators on the amount of response to filing this report. Um, when I looked uh, after last year's filing in, in uh, January as to how many people had filed, and we had about a 50% return filing rate. So that means about 50% of the local governments did not file this report with our office. And ultimately what happened with that is that the senators were frustrated and they said, well, how come nobody's filing? And ultimately the, the result is there was no penalty for not filing. And so what happened is in LB 151, they initiated a penalty 
So beginning this year, if you file this report late, there is a $20 a day penalty for filing that report late. So make sure you make every effort to get that report in. Make sure you note that it's due the same time as the budget. The late fee cannot exceed $2,000, but I can't stress enough, you don't want to be sitting there getting a, a late fee of $20 a day. So ultimately, our office doesn't want you to be late either. I just want to say that um, because it's considered a penalty, the, the money for the late fee actually goes to the state treasurer and the school fine and distributions. So it's not like our office is going to get rich if somebody starts not filing this report. So put that down. Big change for this year as far as we're concerned that you want to make sure that you have that noted. Okay, a couple other LBs. Um, what is 432? This eliminates the delinquent tax allowance unless the federal prime rate is 10% or more. Um, those of you familiar with financing know that the federal prime rate is way, way below that, down in the, the three or four range. Um, we have removed it from the forms altogether. Um, unless the federal prime rate goes up, um, I don't want to confuse people that they can think they can have it or can't have it. So it's been removed completely from the forms. If the percentage ever gets close to 10% again, we'll put something back on the forms. But for right now, we've eliminated it completely. So make sure that you're accounting for that. Um, it also eliminated the budgeting of the litigation of claims. I don't know that that was a, a big deal. LB 217 allows the assessors to send valuations electronically or to post them on their website. So they no longer have to mail out copies of the certifications. So be, be prepared to either um, go to their website and get those, or that you may be getting a call from your assessor to get an email account or some way to uh, send you those certifications. They are allowed to send them by mail, but they are no longer required to. Okay, a couple changes to the budget forms. Um, Schedule B and C have been combined. And for those of you who remember from last year, Schedule C was basically just pulling numbers from Schedule B and doing a calculation to show that you were under the $5 limit. Um, that has all been moved to Schedule B. Uh, there really was no reason just to be pulling numbers between the tabs uh, when we could have it all on one page. So that's why that change was made. Uh, there's also changes for LB-512 with the uh, exemptions there for the limits. We've also added a section to the right on the, on the Schedule B. Um, this was a request by the counties that they wanted to see something in the budget form that showed what the actual levy that, was, that should be set as to what that should look like. Because a lot of the counties were getting confused that they'd look at the budgets and they'd look at that Schedule B or C and they say, oh, the, the school wants a levy of 104.2. Well, in reality, that levy showed what the levy would be after the exemptions were taken out. And so the counties were looking for something to show what the actual levy should be set at. Um, so you should see that on the right side of, of the new Schedule B. Um, and that, that was the, the reason for that. Um, Deanna, quick, yes. quick question. Darren? Asks, I'm assuming this is uh, concerning the uh, valuations. Okay. Um, he asks, will they post them earlier then? There is nothing that requires valuations to be posted before August 20th. Um, it, it, may, it may allow them to get them posted before then, uh, but nothing requires them to do it earlier than August 20th. So that day stays the same. Um, we did a, a data search and no one was using the exemption for the prior to 1998 lease purchase rows. Um, so those rows were eliminated from the Schedule B because they're, you can't go back now and say you had a, a purchase uh, back in 98. So 
Um, that part is basically done as far as we're concerned in the statutes, and so we removed it from the forms. Um, also, there's no calculation at the at the bottom for treasurer's commissions or delinquent taxes. Um, basically, as I just talked about, they eliminated the ability to add delinquent taxes on. And when we were researching that change to the statute, um, there's also no verification that you can add on the treasurer's commission. Um, so. So basically, you can't take a levy and say, oh, well, it's a dollar five that we're going to receive. The levy limit says a dollar five. So you can't have a dollar five point zero zero one um, and still be in compliance. So that's why that calculation is changed on Schedule B. Um, but ultimately, um, I think I've got a small shot of Schedule B here. You probably won't be able to read it. But what will happen is it still talks about how much do you get in property taxes, um, your exemptions, especially for the bonds and the voluntary termination. Um, it'll come down here to the bottom to a, a net amount. Um, it'll do a calculation based on your valuation that you put in on the front page. And it's going to add in right here and say, um, if, we, if we take those together, does it equal or is it less than a dollar five and so that's the purpose of this form to show that you are under that dollar five limit this area over here is the one i was talking about that's going to show the county what the levy should be set at um, so that way the county hopefully can make sure those levies get set correctly does that then allow for the valuation to be changed for bond funds if they have different valuations that they're being taxed on um, for um, I don't know that it takes into account any kind of different valuation. Uh, we can certainly look at that. that. It certainly does over here. Um, I believe that this one of these columns over here does that. Um, I'm not sure if it does in this area here or not. It probably doesn't need to over there, but on the right side, if they're setting it for the county's purposes, there may be different valuations for different right. bonds. So. Right, and, and that's why there's actually boxes here down below to actually allow you to split any kind of, of number that you need to split. So we'll see how this goes this year. Um, as always, our office, if you have recommendations for the forms, please let us know. Um, we're always willing to listen to those and take those into consideration. But yeah, if there is issues with this new portion, be sure you let me know. We can uh, adjust those or correct those, um, especially for future years. But there is blank rows here in the event that you need something split out for more than what these initial boxes are. Okay, also um, we've updated uh, some of the worksheets, specifically the general fund was moved to one tab. Um, in today's world of more electronic and less paper, we set that up as one tab so that the whole sheet flows um, and that you're not flipping between tabs to get the general fund picture. Uh, there's more identification for different receipt types. Once again, the delinquent tax calculation has been removed because of the new LB. Um, personal or property tax credit row was expanded to include the personal property tax credit that's new this year. And just more of a description for the N NCLB row labels. Um, to help with clarification. Um, I will mention that I've had a couple calls on the general fund. When we moved that to one tab, the print screen on that was set up to be a one page by one page. And so apparently some of your eyes are not quite as good as my eyes and that uh, you, you can't read those as well as I can. Um, so um, you are not locked out from changing the font or the print size or the print breaks on that page. So you certainly can uh, adjust that to your own printability. Um, you can make it three pages, wh whatever you need if you want to print it. Um, I guess when I was doing it, I was thinking that the worksheets were more electronic and that less people would be printing those. And I didn't even think about print screening it to see what it would look like. So. Uh, but like I said, you are not locked from that, so you certainly can, can make those adjustments yourself. Um, if you have trouble with that, you can uh, always send it to me and, and I can uh, adjust that for you. Um, we'll, we'll just take that out how we can. 
Um, I did want to talk about tax credits a little bit because I had gotten a few phone calls here uh, this spring regarding these tax credits. And so I want to make sure everybody knows what these are. Um, tax credits basically is where the state pays part of the, the tax bill. So in a, in a, a simplified form, if, if the, the school wanted $10,000 in property taxes, the property owners may pay $9,000 of that tax bill and the state's going to pay $1,000 of that tax bill. So the tax credits are not in addition to what you see coming in from the, the property owners or on your county assess or uh, county treasurer reports. You would have to add the tax credits to the tax taxes being collected in order to determine um, you know, the full amount of taxes you're receiving. So don't don't think of that as an addition to the amount of taxes you're getting. It's actually just a different place you're getting it from. Um, but the tax credits come out through uh, through the spring. Basically, the first half of real estate comes in January. The county gets a one percent commission on that. Centrally assessed comes out in February. The county gets no commission on that portion. First half of the personal property credit comes out in the end of February. Um, the county does get a 1% commission on that. The second half of real estate comes out the 1st of April. And the second half of the personal property comes out June 30th. Um, and then the, the county actually has to return any excess that they have back to the state by June 30th. So that just gives you a little time break as to when you should be seeing those tax credits on your uh, your reports from the county treasurers. Um, if you have questions about any of those, uh, feel free to call our office or send me an email um, and I can help explain uh, what those are or why you're getting those. All right, Ian, we have a question here. Uh, LaVon Hood uh, wrote, interlocal page does not resize for wrapped text on rows. Suggestions. Okay. The interlocal page doesn't, doesn't what? Resized. Resized for wrapped text on rows. Suggested. Okay, I'll take a look at that. Thanks for letting me know. And then Brian says to clarify, personal property tax receipts are part of local property tax request. That is correct. The personal property tax credit is part of what you ask for in, in taxes. It's just a difference of who you're getting it from. So very important, even though you may see past history of those monies coming in, you should not budget for that money. Do not budget for tax credits because that is just, you're getting the money from the state instead of the property owners directly. But if you budget for a tax credit, you are actually going to short yourself on your tax receipts because you will never get that money twice. Okay, so very important that to budget for it. You can show it as actual that you got the money um, from that tax credit in your actual numbers, but you don't want to budget for it. Yeah, I believe it's blocked out so that just as a reminder, but if you're thinking that that's an error or something, it is not an error, you, you should be blocked out from that. Okay, a couple of dates to remember. Um, August 20th, that is still the assessor evaluation date. September 20th, that's still the budget due date. October 13th, that is still the last day for the tax request to be put into the county board. And that big November 5th day, that's the last day to correct an error that's in the levy. Um, once again, I want to stress that um, you get to pass November 5th, it's too late. So even though every effort's made to make sure the levies are set correctly, ultimately every year there seems to be somebody basically upset that their levy got set incorrectly. So um, I can't stress enough looking after the county sets those levies in October that you, you double check. Um, there was a lot of discussion this year in the legislature regarding hearings and budget hearing specifically. So I just wanted to go over this 
make sure everybody has a reminder, I guess. Um, as I said earlier, you have to publish the numbers, the date, time, and place of the hearing at least four days prior to the meeting day. Um, you have to have the budget available to the public at the hearing. So that doesn't mean you just hand it out to the, the board members and the, and the public can't look at it. You have to have copies available or in some format you have to be available to make copies for anybody that shows up that wants one. Uh, the, the statutes were set up that the board should consider the taxpayer concerns at that hearing. Um, it was never intended in the statutes that um, you have the hearing and you close the hearing and you adopt the budget maybe immediately after. Um, I know that that happens a lot of times, but the, the statutes were never set up to be interpreted that way. They were set up that you would have the hearing, then you would go back interpret what that hearing meant or what was said at that hearing and then you come back make adjustments if you want to the budget and then you adopt it so there is nothing that requires the budget to be adopted the same night or the same meeting as the hearing and i will mention that lb 479 which is on the general file actually would require the hearing to be held at a separate meeting than when the budget is adopted the initial LB was actually going to require a 30-day waiting period between the day of the hearing and the day of the adoption. Um, I believe that was amended out to take the 30 days out, but this still is a viable LB out there, and I know there's a lot of passion out there by some senators regarding this LB, so I would not be surprised at all that next year at this time we're talking about a new requirement regarding this hearing. So I can't stress enough that you, you make sure that you're taking those into consideration. If you're one of those schools that holds your, your hearing and plans to adopt on September 20th, I think you're asking for trouble. I, I do not think that's a good plan to hold your hearing and, and basically at, at the hearing say, well, we can't make any changes because we have to file this by midnight tonight. I don't think that's a, a very good plan, and I would strongly suggest you think of another plan between now and then um, to eliminate those types of problems. Yeah, Amy Shane uh, suggests um, having valuations prior to August 20th. Uh, that would help in this area, but I wouldn't know how to go around. Um, yeah, the August that. 20th date is in statute, so that would take a, a requirement of the statute. Um, whenever that has been brought up in the past, you run into issues with the county assessors forcing back, saying they don't have enough time to get the evaluations done by August 20th in the first place. Um, because when you look at the entire, I guess, tax cycle, um, valuations or taxes are assessed as of January 1st. The assessors have to send out those valuations to the property owners. They property owners have the whole month of June and into July to actually protest their valuations. That's when the county boards are hearing those value protests. And then the county boards have to present or approve or deny those valuation protests in August. And so you're hearing from the county assessors that they're already pressed and stressed to get it out by August 20th. They'd actually like to go the other way. They, they want more days to be able to get the valuations out. So I know that that's always been a, a time problem um, of getting that August 20th date changed is that the assessors um, are strongly adamant that, that that's already too early. Um, I personally think you'd have a better shot of trying to move the September 20th date to September 30th than you would moving the August 20th date. But that still would take a taxpayer or a legislative change also. Um, that, that's not something that, that we can just make a decision on. Um, just a reminder about the publications. Statute 13506 is the statute that says if you adopt a budget which is different than what was published, and this goes back to, you know, publishing your numbers and then holding that hearing um, as early as possible before you actually adopt the budget. Uh, it goes back to that if you end up doing 
to adopting a budget that's different than was published. You have 20 days to publish a summary of what you ended up adopting that was different than what was originally published. Um, the summary needs to include the items that changed and the reason for the changes. So for example, if you would um, get your numbers together, we'll say the end of August, um, and you, you get it published, and maybe you have the hearing, we'll say, we'll say September 10th, you, uh, you're able to hold a hearing. Um, you hold the hearing and uh, the discussion about making some adjustments, maybe taxes go up or down, um, some other numbers go up or down, whatever that is. Um, then, you, then you're able to make those changes. You do not have to have a second hearing. You are only required to have one budget hearing. Um, after that budget hearing, then the, the board can come back, um, decide what they actually want to adopt, and then if that happens to be different than what was published, then you have 20 days to, to publish that, um, that summary. So just keep that in mind. Um, not to put LPS on, on the, the link here, but I know LPS has already held a budget hearing. Um, to discuss because it was in the in the papers around here just yesterday about their first budget hearing. So really think about your timing of these budget hearings. Um, I, I just don't want it to become a, a legislative thing that the legislature makes it really tight and hard for people to deal with. Um, I, th I think if if those concerns go away or people aren't stressed about those concerns, there may be less push for legislative change. For that. A reminder about cash reserves. Um, basically, a cash reserve are the funds that are required for the period before you get the money. And as you all know, just because you adopt that budget by September 20th, you're not going to get that money for several months. Uh, most of that money is not going to come in until May or even the following September. Um, so you're really looking at a lag time there between when you adopt the budget versus when you get the money. That's the whole point of a cash reserve. And so make sure you're, you're taking into consideration whether or not um, you have an adequate cash reserve. The statutes do prohibit you from having more than a 50% cash reserve. And the 50% is of the budget of disbursement. Um, budget amendments, right now is the time frame when everybody's amending budgets. Um, they are a cash budget. So if it says you're not going to spend more than a million dollars, you need to amend the budget if you're going to spend more than a million dollars. So make sure that you're monitoring that. Um, you have to make the amendment before the end of the fiscal year. Um, you must file it with the auditor of the county clerk in education if you do make any kind of an amendment. We do have examples and instructions on our website for amending a budget. Um, some of you will notice that the budget amendment tab was removed from the school budget forms. Um, the reason for that is it become apparent or that I guess it was brought up that it was easier to take the original budget hearing tab and basically copy the cells of the original budget and paste them down below where you paste the values. That way it does not change anything. You are then allowed to go in to the budget forms, make your amendments or your changes where you need them. Everything flows forward and actually goes into that new, new portion of the hearing um, and makes all the changes for you. Then you are only required to make changes to the wording verbiage up above as to the new hearing and the budget amendment hearing. So that's why that, that change was made. Um, if anybody has questions on how to do that, um, I, think, I think ultimately it will be easier for you um, to, to copy and paste those values. And that way you can make your amendments right in the budget forms and not have um, issues with, it, with the linking. And then just as a final reminder, you have to file the budgets with our office, audit reports, and that all-important interlocal agreement report. So all of those need to be filed with our office. Um, just a quick reminder about where you can get information. Uh, local government tab there across the top. 
Um, you'll see one that's called budget information. That's where you're going to go get those forms. We also scan and provide all budgets. Um, so if you're looking for the county budget or another school budget, those are all fought, scanned and put out here under the search budget function. Um, so you should be able to find any of those. We also have interlocal agreement reports out there. So if you're new and you're like, I don't know where that form's at. I don't know if they filed it last year. Um, you can go out and look at your school's interlocal report. It should be out here under the search interlocal. Um, we also have audits out there if you're looking for audit reports of other schools. Um, so those information is all out here on our website. And then if you're ready to submit forms, um, along the top there you'll also see a, a submit forms area. And that's where you can submit your audit, your budget, or your interlocal agreement. Um, so those can all be uh, all sent electronically as PDF forms. And I think that's the end of my screens. Looks like Jim's up next. Any other questions for Deanne before she is fully done? All right, Jen, have at it. All right. Hello, everyone. Jen Udemark with State Aid and um, School Finance. Um, I actually just have a few things that I want to. Um, review today that will be coming up in the next couple days, that will be coming up also in the next couple months, and then just a couple um, items or bills that were enacted, enacted through the last um, legislative session. So the first thing, okay. the first thing I want to start out with is um, just to review lump sum payments. Um, any districts that had a 2016-17 positive prior year correction can apply for the lump sum payment. And this allows the district to receive up to 100% of the correction as a single lump sum payment in September of 2017. So if you had a 16-17 positive prior year correction that was equal to or greater than $1,000 um, on, on or before July 15th coming up, uh, we will notify you via email to let you know of this. Um, if you are interested in the lump sum payment, we will need you to respond to us by August 15th, and there'll be directions in that email. After that, um, we receive the information from you. We'll prepare it for the September board meeting. Um, after that, then we will again notify you on or before September 15th that um, we'll let you know of the board approval, we'll let you know the amount of the lump sum, and then we'll also let you know the any reduction to the uh, remaining nine state aid payments. If your 2016-17 positive prior year correction is less than $1,000, there is nothing for you to do. Um, NDE will make will automatically just make the payment and it will be without application. So that will go ahead and just come your way in the, um, September 2017. The next uh, kind of housekeeping item is um, I just want to touch a little bit on the change in school district boundaries due to annexation by a city or village. A, um, the, uh, so essentially a school district can apply for additional TOSA aid if they have had property that has um, property that has been lost due to annexation by a city or village. Um, the city or village must have a, a school district that has increased in size due to this change in boundaries. So if this is excuse me, applies to you, um, there are forms that are available for, to request. So contact me. I will get the form out to you. Uh, once you have that completed, you're going to go ahead and send that back to me by August 20th. Um, that date is just so that I can go ahead and get these state aid payments set up by the statutory due date. Um, another piece that um, make sure if you do complete this form that you also make a copy for the district of who the valuation was transferred to. Once I receive this form in the legal description of the um, valuation, we will go ahead and we will um, recalculate the 2017 aid for your district. We will go ahead and recertify back to you and we will calculate it based on um, without the adjusted valuation. Um, after that, if there's any additional aid, what we will do then is included in the 2017 
um, 18 aid payments that will go from 17, excuse me, September 2017 to June of 2018. Um, so again, those forms are available to you. Um, the next item is data collection. We have four of them that are available at this point in time um, that will be open. They're in their audit window phase. They're open for a couple more days till June 30th. We have three of them in the CDC, the Consolidated Data Collection. The first one is the days in session. Uh, this is where you'll report your actual number of days the school is open with students and teachers. You also will need to complete the um, instructional program hours in the CDC. This is the actual instructional program hours in session for the school year. And the last one is the pupil transportation report. Um, this one will need to be completed by all districts, even if the district does not provide people transportation services. Uh, when you complete this one, the one of my particular interest is the route miles. Um, you will want to complete route miles, regular route miles to and from school for students that are in pre-K through the grade 12, including SPED. You will also want to report route miles uh, between your attendance sites, also including SPED. And the route miles that you do not report would be your activity travel, uh, mileage paid to parents, and then any um, driver education class mileage. And so that would be, um, that's the item I want to make sure you get completed on that report. The last um, data collection that we have is in NISRS, the Nebraska Student and Staff Record System. This is the, uh, the student summary attendance. You will need to complete um, for each uh, student enrolled uh, by location, you're going to want to report their days present, days absent, and their full-time equivalency. Um, so in a couple days, those wrap up. Please make sure that you have those completed. Um, on that note, I kind of do want to follow up with a little bit of the uh, these timelines that occur with uh, these data collections. So on June 15th, that was the due date for these data collections. At that point in time, um, we hope that you have all your data entered into or uploaded into our systems. Um, uh, just yesterday, I believe, Tom has contacted each of the districts that we do not see any data for at this point. We just want to be a friendly reminder because we've had uh, times where, uh, you know, a district may believe they uploaded it and, 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 in fact, at the end of the day, it's not there. So we've reached out to those districts um, that we still need to see data entered for these collections. The second two weeks after that due date um, is the audit window. And that, again, as we talked about, is open until June 30th. This is the point in time, if you could please review the data. Um, review the data that you want to upload, review it how it uploaded, um, make sure that there was no discrepancies between that. Uh, have a couple sets of eyes check it. Make sure it's you know accurate, but also make sure that it's relevant, reliable. Um, there's times there may be data entered, but it may it may take someone who knows this data to determine if it's, it's good quality and reliable data. The other uh, last thing on that audit window is make sure that the uh, collections receive their local approval. Uh, those are kind of the key things to make sure you do in these last two weeks. Uh, the, one of the most important things is um, each year you do hear from this from us that deadlines are final. And I know um, it is very difficult for both Bryce and I that we do always receive a couple calls from a district that um, once there's some financing attached to it or these audit windows have closed, does, they find a discrepancy. And it's always difficult to have to turn away a district saying, unfortunately, at this point in time, we cannot turn back um, and redo it. So um, please, please, please make sure that the um, information is correct. Don't wait for financing to be tied to this data. Um, always review it. Um, Essentially what happens is this data just doesn't become a part of TIOSA. I am one step in the process. The week after the audit window closed, the uh, data team will take the data, prepare it for um, reporting. And so TIOSA is a form of the reporting. We also have uh, federal SPED reporting. We have Title I um, comparability. We have grant writing, um, NSAA uh, reporting. Uh, we also have uh, statistical reporting. We also have the unknown because this data becomes part of our website um, that we do keep all the data consistent. We don't change it to this point because it goes to multiple sources. So again, please check the data. It's always very difficult to turn a district away that finds an error down the road. Um, 
just as a, a note of a resource in NISRS, uh, Nebraska Student Staff Record System, we do have the state a component verification piece. Um, this is an easy, easy place to go check the data that we will be using in state aid. It also shows you multiple sources all in one place. So you're going to see these collections that are used for state aid in one place, at least as a single piece of reference, you can see what will be included in state aid. Another piece to keep in mind is that the CDC and NISRs are live systems. They will continue to change. This state aid component verification piece um, is locked down. It does not change. So it's a great audible piece to determine where you are at with uh, some of your information at the point in time that we pulled it to be used in the TOSIC calculation. And so again, that's just another resource. If you want to do a quick check, we have other, other uh, a lot of valid, valid validations and verification reports that are also available. Um, now I'm going to kind of shift a little further down the road. Um, once we get back from admin days, August 1st, we will go ahead and start calculating that 17-18 uh, recalculation of TIOSA. And this is that point in time that we come through and we replace the fall membership with the average daily membership. Assessed valuations become replaced with certified valuations and the 15-16 annual financial reports will be replaced with any amended 15-16 annual financial reports. Um, also in the recalculation, the comparison groups that are used in basic funding do remain the same. But essentially, I just want to be a reminder today that if you have any amended 15-16 annual financial reports that you are anticipating sending to us, please do so by July 31st to have this included in the 17-18 recalculation of TIOSA. Um, just another date on the calendar to um, watch as that comes up in the next month. A couple other items that I wanted to just touch base on for the recalculation is the local effort rate. This is an item that is unique in the recalculation. Um, just as a reminder, the local effort rate is that hypothetical tax rate that holds property accountable as a resource of the formula. Um, it is five cents below the maximum levy, so when we run certification, the local effort rate is set at a dollar. Uh, when we come around and do the recalculation in the fall, uh, the local effort rate floats. This is the amount that is that, or this is the item that's that balancing factor for us to always, um, when we calculate, we will calculate for the same amount of funding. So 998 million will be calculated for certification, 998 million will be calculated for recalculation. What changes is the distribution of the funding between the districts. Um, sorry, Jen. Yeah. Darren would like to know where is the slide that gives us more state aid. <laughs> Bryce told me to leave that one out, so I you have send to me some, follow. You send me some good jokes, we'll work on that. <laughs> work appropriate jokes. Oh, very good. Thanks, Darren. Um, so, um, you know, just as a reminder, we do um, when we do recalculation, it is the same amount of money. What changes is the distribution amongst the districts. In order to achieve that, um, we set the local effort rate to float. So it could be just above a dollar at 1.0000999, or it could be just below a dollar at 0.99999. It just it depends where everything lands um, at the end of the day. The last piece is that I want to touch base on with the recalculation is the prior year correction. I do consistently get phone calls for this, and so that's why I just want to make sure that we touch base on this. Um, what happens is uh, when we do this, from the time we calculate certification to the time we do the recalculation that we just got done talking about, the distribution changes for the district. And so it could be a positive amount, it could be a negative amount. But what happens is that difference is what then becomes the prior year correction. When the recalculation comes out, this could be the last week in October or the first week in November. At this point in time, we have already started paying your 17-18 state aid. That started in September. So what happens is it gets tacked on to the next state aid. So after, after our recalculation of 17-18 in November, and we publish that, we will add that to the 18-19 TOSA aid. Um, and so it's can be difficult to think about, but if you just try to keep it simple, it's just the difference of your prior year certification um, is recalculated. The piece I just want to add on to this one is, though, this coming year, what we're going to have is we have the 1819 state aid. That's going to be part of your September payment. Um, and what you're also going to have is you're going to have your 1617 prior year correction, which could be negative or positive. 
this year what we will also have which doesn't often happen i believe is the we will have the carried forward meaning in 16 17 we had multiple districts i think there was about 30 districts that did not receive any aid um, essentially they do not have any voucher funding they do not have any the allocated income tax was wiped out by the um, minimum levy adjustment and so there was no aid to offset the prior year correction um, the 15 16 prior year correction so there is going to be a third piece this year um, called the carry carryover, um, like a 15 16 carryover. So um, just be aware of that. It is on your certification document. If you have any questions, please feel free to call. Now we're going to spend a couple of minutes on just TIOSA. Most of this should be review, um, but just in case uh, someone has missed any of this review up to this point in time. Uh, as we actually modeled the 17-18 state aid at $1.47 billion. Uh, we came back this May on May 25th and certified it at $998 million at 1.9% increase over the prior year. Uh, we ended up with 174 non-equalized districts, 71 equalized districts, four more became non-equalized in this formula. Um, and, you know, and again, this is historical at this point that LB119 um, is basically came and said that they were going to push back certification to June 1st, on or before June 1st, which we did. We certified on May 25th. Um, this allowed the um, legislature to work out any details on how to change state aid, which we also know that they did too. So, um, but just keep in mind, next year, um, come this March 2018, we will go ahead and at this point in time, we should certify um, by March 1st. Big piece is LB 109, which did become enacted, and um, this one has a lot of moving parts in it. And I just want to do a very high level, very quick overview of it. In front of you, what you have right now are three columns. Um, the first one is the changes that occurred in LB 409 to TIOSA. The second column is the reductions that occurred to 17, 18, 18, and then the reductions that occurred in 15, 16, 19, 18, and the third column. So um, back to the first column, the first item that was changed was the cost growth factor was changed from 2.5% to 1.5%. Um, the cost growth factor is uh, what is used for the general fund operating expenditures. Expenditures, the two-year-old general fund operating, general, excuse me, general fund operating expenditures up to the current. Um, so that was the first reduction that we had, and then that helps calculate the new side of the formula. The second change was an increase in the LER from a dollar to 1.0203. This um, increases the resources, which also closes that funding gap. Both these items does only impact the equalized districts. Then what came along after that was um, the net option funding would be calculated at 95% of the statewide average basic funding for formula students instead of 100%. Um, this piece is what impacts the non-equalized districts. Yes, equalized districts also have net option, but the equalization aid would go ahead and have to pick up that loss. So there was no impact to the equalized districts for that piece. Um, and then the last item was transition aid was going to include the 1718 community achievement plan piece. Um, the transition aid is calculated off 1617 um, TIOSA, but we also recognize that the 1718 community achievement plan aid is a resources is a resource and would be included calculation. And so with those, all four of those items combined, the 1718 um, aid took a reduction of about 48 million. Um, the last column, yeah, excuse me, yeah, 48 million. The last column um, is estimates that we've got from, we were provided to us from the Legislative Fiscal Office on 1819. Please take these numbers with a grain of salt. They're all variables at this point, um, especially valuation is the most um, hard to predict. And so what you can basically see is there will be a um, decrease of about 74 million. Um, the increase in the LER went up about 5 million. The, the increase in reduction went up about 5 million. And then option funding went up, increase in reduction went up about 200,000. The piece I want you to recognize is that um, reduction in the cost growth factor um, doubled. It went from a reduction from in 16 or 17, 18 of 21 million up to 43 million in 18, 19. The reason behind that is because 
the cost growth factor in 17 18 went from 5% to 4%. The cost growth factor in 18 19 went from 5% to 3%. So it, um, 17, 18, 17 18 had a 1% reduction, 18 19 has a 2% reduction. So that's why you'll see a further decrease in 18 19. Just a couple more items on 409. Um, these uh, two charts you have in front of you are just independent. I just put them on the same slide. The one on the left is a is just looking at this reduction as a percentage of general fund operating expenditures. Simply saying a district could see about a 0.5% to a 3.7% decrease in total spending. The chart on the right um, essentially, when we modeled aid at the 1.47 billion, 94% uh, of the funding went to equalized districts, and 6% of the funding went to non-equalized districts. Um, with the reduction of 409, um, the um, the rate for non uh, or the amount of funding that goes to equalized districts is still 94%, and the amount of funding that goes to non-equalized districts is still 6%. So the funding ratio stayed the same from under current statute to um, what came through with LB 409. The last item with 409, I will say at the end of the day, 409 was kind of exhausting. There was a lot of items, changes, things to keep track of. And so um, 409 also changed the certified budget authority. Um, essentially, when we certify budget authority, it's calculated three ways. Um, we have a budget-based calculation, a formula needs calculation, and a student growth calculation. The, um, and then whichever is the highest is what becomes the district certified budget authority. The, this will impact for the upcoming biennium. Uh, the budget-based calculation is calculated, calculated off the cost growth factor, which was reduced from 2.5% to 1.5%. And the formula needs calculation will now be calculated off a reduced formula needs because of TIOSA. So um, what we had is we had four districts leave the budget-based calculation, and two went to the formula needs calculation, two went to the student growth calculation. We had 237 districts out of the 245 that did receive a reduced um, certified budget authority up to 1.06%. Um, so that is kind of the highlight there for certified budget authority. Um, as always, when we certify, we put out a brand new TIOSA doc that has all the changes, um, these statutory changes, um, and how it was calculated. It, uh, this document really does contain the sources of information that we, sources that we use to calculate TIOSA. It also um, will go through the calculation from a, dis, like a dictionary perspective and then an FAQ perspective. Um, you know, and you can always call if you have any questions. This is available on our website. Um, and it's also, it's always something to have, you know, handy for uh, questions that you might have. The last item I want to touch base on is LB 512, which had many items to it. The piece I just kind of want to talk about today is enrollment options. Um, this one I just kind of want to, they added two words to this change for 79-237. Uh, I just kind of want to throw out an example. Um, Today, and I, I want to bring this up because this is, could be impacting today um, before school starts. Um, if a student were to come to your district today before school starts and, and said, um, I want to come to your district as an option student, and um, yes, it's after the March 15th deadline, you would require both the signatures, but this student moved after February 1st into this district, and so you would only need the approval of the option district. Well, statute says that you would only need the approval of the option district for the upcoming school year. Well, school hasn't started yet, um, and so you would just need the approval of the single option district, your district. If this same student, and this is not under the current law today, this is prior to the changes. If this same student had walked into your um, school the very first day school starts this year and said the same scenario, I want to move in, or I want to option into your district, um, I moved into this other district after February 1st, at that point in time, you would have said that you need the approval from the option district and the resident district. That's because you no longer are at that point in time with their uh, the upcoming school year. It's not 17-18 anymore. It's 18-19 because school started. 
So that always kind of made a difference, but it always felt like a little bit like it penalized the student for having to move maybe in the middle of the school year or once the school year started. So two words were added, the words recurrent or. Um, what that will do now is it does not matter when the student moves into the district after February 1st, if it is for the current year or the upcoming school year. Um, the student will only need the approval of the option district um, at either point in time. So I think that it's easier for us to um, remember this guideline, but it's also, um, I think, a good, a good decision for the student. So um, that is the highlight of enrollment option this year. If you have any questions, all the statutes are covered in Rule 19, and we have a pretty extensive list at this point for the FAQs um, that we are always adding to. So if you don't see something on there, please notify me, let me know. You can always call Tom. He's great um, for enrollment option two. And um, I am going to hand this over to someone. But thank you so much for uh, taking the time today to listen to this. And uh, looks like I'm going to have Tom to talk to you next. Any last questions for Jen at all, guys? Okay, Tom, you're up. Excellent, thank you. As you know, I've been traveling around the state, visiting districts, doing LEP and poverty reviews. Um, I visited 25 school districts this year again. Um, I'm up to 103 school districts, and we will review all school districts, um, all 244 going forward. Um, it will take me until 2022 to complete all those reviews, but I do have a plan, <laughs> so you're in there somewhere. Um, as you know, you're going to be start working on your 16, 17 AFRs. Um, part of that is the LEP and poverty requirements. We have put a link out there in our resource pages um, that tells you what the 117.65% is. Um, so I'd re I would review that to ensure that you're meeting that requirement. Um, if you have any questions, give me a call, Janice, Bill, any of us will be able to help you with that. I do have a link to it later in the resources page. Um, not all districts are currently submitting a poverty plan. There's still 51 districts not submitting a plan at all. Um, if legislation would change, you're going to be filling out your 18, 19 um, LEP and poverty plans coming up this fall. And if legislation would change, you would miss out on funding. If just want to make you aware of that. A typical review process, um, I would come out, we'll review the LEP and the poverty narrative. Um, we'll discuss best practices. Uh, creating a great learning environment um, for LEP students is also a great learning environment for all students. Um, encouraging parents' involvement is good for all kiddos. Um, outreach programs in the community create uh, community pride, which creates great school districts. Um, discuss optional funding as far as pre-K, summer school, before and after school programs, dual credit, SAT, ACT prep. Um, we would review the coding. Um, as you know, poverty and LEP funding is 1150 and 1160. Make sure that you're coding all your expenses there for those. And there's no penalty for going over the 117.65%. So I would encourage you to uh, book what you're actually expending there to show your district's true needs in LEP and poverty. I can't, can't guarantee you any more funding, but at least show your need, and then that way when legislation asks us what is the need for Palmyra, we can show them they're spending 500000 but they're only getting 200000 Those are made-up numbers. I don't know. The only, the only <laughs> exception to that would be if you're in a situation where your, say, summer school is something you use as part of your poverty plan, it may make sense for you to code to get to your 117.65 percent in poverty, and then put the rest over in summer school. That way, you get reimbursed through TIOSA for summer school if you have a qualifying summer school. So, you got there's several factors you got to look there. But if there's nothing that's going to hurt you, then then Tom's recommendation is a, is a great recommendation. I was also wondering too, with that coding change, if you were not to like the term, you know. Because you would get the summer school. I, I would be I would be I would be cautious towards still doing that. I guess it, it depends. It's kind of a guessing game because if legislation changes and allows summer school reimbursements, you'd be better off with it in summer school. If, if legislation changes and says we're gonna give you more poverty, if you had more poverty, then you're better off in poverty. So it, it's somewhat of a guessing game. Uh, timelines for this. Uh, the 
GMS will open August 1st to submit your LEP and poverty plans. It closes October 16th this year. Um, it is in GMS this year. As you know, that was a change from last year. I provided a link to that in my resources page, um, a couple slides down from here. Um, submit a plan again, even if it's zero. Um, we don't know what legislation will do. Um, so if you don't submit a plan, you are going to get zero in the future. We do calculate a, uh, a poverty um, allowance for all 245 school districts currently. That's why I encourage you to submit a plan with some amount of money in it. Uh, because if legislation were to change, then you would not receive any funding if you put zero in that. Um, during the review, we talk about attendance and mobility, um, what you're doing proactively and reactively to encourage attendance, um, what you're doing transportation-wise to pick up kiddos, are you going special routes, pickup sites, um, parents' um, expense reimbursement, um, services to support transition, um, within your school district and even uh, within other school districts, what kind of working relationship do you have with other school districts? Um, and then services for students of absence or mobility issues. Um, you know, are you one-to-one -one school, students taking tablets home so they can get their homework done? Or if they don't have Wi-Fi in the house, are you working with community so that they can go to the library and get their homework done? Um, other communities have worked with like Burger King so kids can go there as long as they're not rowdy. Um, we'd also. We're saying they would never let James. <laughs> She's always good. I'm always good. <laughs> uh, parent involvement. We talk about parent and family engagement opportunities, um, creating diverse um, opportunities so that everybody feels a part of it. Um, doing surveys, get community involvement. Uh, survey monkeys out there. It's a free survey website to create these easy surveys to gauge what your community is thinking. Um, instructional services, um, what kind of practices are you doing to maintain class size? Are you pushing a, a para into a classroom or are you splitting classes, um, K through six? Um, support staff, what kind of support staff do you have? Um, is that a para, a, a counselor? And then uninterrupted teaching time, the blocks of the reading and the math for the kiddos to get that. Um, specialized services, early childhood, um, developing a pre-K program really helps poverty kiddos. Um, you can do a three and a four year old or maybe you just have room for a four year old. Um, access to social workers and counselors. Um, not everybody has a social worker on hand, but maybe you have a, a counselor that's split between school buildings. Um, extended school day or year, maybe you're doing an after school program or you're doing like a, a jump start program before school starts to get the kids acclimated again before they uh, charge full board in the school year again. Uh, summer school, um, you know, Bryce brought it up earlier. Possibly if you're a non-equalized school district, you re redo your summer school um, so that it better works for your community. And, you know, whatever works best for your kiddos is what you need to do. Um, and then other specialized services we would discuss as well. So. Um, professional development, we would talk about what you're doing to uh, help uh, your teachers that are new or newly assigned into your group. Um, do you have a, a way that your school district does things? Is there um, a certain classroom style that you have? Um, are you working with your ESU to save money and group that uh, mentoring together? Um, staff development, again, working with the ESU to bring a lot of teachers into a training all at one time is cheaper than than hiring somebody to bring into the school. Um, also, we talk about the evaluation of the plan. Uh, there is no rule that says that this is a, a must, um, but I strongly encourage you to all uh, look at your plan and determine its effectiveness, and also work, you know, put it in line with your school improvement plan and make sure that it uh, it fits with that as well. And then the other category, anything that doesn't fit into a category I already talked about, or maybe you had a huge previous change from the year before, you can describe that here in the other category and then we catch it for the next year. Um, we did provide a list of allowable expenditures for poverty. It's out on our website now. 
Um, as most of you know, salary and benefits, uh, initiatives to improve attendance, parent education, uh, preschool costs, summer school, staff development, and counselors are some of those. Uh, there is a very extensive list out there. I encourage you to go out and look at it and see what else, see what other items might be able to be charged off to poverty expenses. I'll talk about the LEP plan for a little bit now. Um, when I come into the school district, we talk about how you identify the students are using Lost Links, uh, Woodcock Luno's, um, ELPA 21. Uh, what process are you doing? To, what process do you go through to identify these students? And then how they're placed into a classroom? Uh, criteria for determining who qualifies. Is there a group that meets and then determines uh, which classroom they would be in or which program they would be in, whether it's a newcomer or if they're being integrated into a classroom? Instructional approaches, again, you know, uh, what works best for your school district uh, would be the best approach for your, your needs. Um, then assessment of students' progress, uh, we talked about that a little bit. Of course, it's done annually through the OPA. Um, so you determine that at year end and then decide where uh, each student will be placed the next year. Uh, but it's also good to measure data as throughout the school year to make sure that you're on the right approach. Um, different from the poverty plan, the LE plan is required to have an evaluation per Rule 15. Um, if you haven't done that, I would encourage you, Rule 15 lays it out for you uh, very easily. Just go and do that, evaluate your plan uh, annually, and then the data you use to evaluate that plan. It's also required to be on file with the superintendent um, per Rule 15, just in case a, a patron wanted to ask for it. And then again, the other items, anything that doesn't fit into a category we talked about, you would plug that in here as well. Um, we also did a, a list of allowable expenditures for LEP um, expenditures. That's also out on our website. Identify, identifying students, salaries and benefits, resources, staff development, um, evaluating plans, social workers and counselors. Um, there's a lot of other items out there. I would, I would encourage you to review that list and see if there's any items you're missing currently. Then we would talk about use of census data on determining how much of the LEP or poverty uh, count you would you would take off. Um, you know, maybe you developed a new math class because kiddos just weren't getting algebra three, four in one, one class setting. So you developed a class that's two class setting. Um, take a head count on a certain day. Um, if a percent of those kiddos are from the LEP or poverty demographic, then you could charge those split that amount of expenses off to the LEP and poverty demographic. All right, Tom. Uh, Mark's got a question, or yeah, looks like a question. I see on the website the LEP and poverty allowance uh, the 117.65% for the 16-17. Will NDE publish or share with districts the maximum allowance a district qualifies for? We have not published or made that information available in the past um, as far as publishing it kind of. Um, it's kind of one of those political issues that we ran across. We've discussed that before with um, some of the other leadership at NDE and, and it was um, the decision was made to not publish that information but if you want to know what your school districts is you send us a request and we will tell you what the calculated amount was for your district so we'll gladly give you that information we just are not comfortable posting that amount on the website uh, for political reasons Um, develop some kind of rationale of, of why you're splitting that uh, the funding between poverty, LEP, or general funds. Um, keep that on hand. It may be just as easy as 50% of your kiddos in that class are from that demographic. Um, just keep it on hand just in case um, we were to come out and do a little more intensive state review. Um, and then also in GNS, you can develop your plan in Word format and then upload it. And then just each question answer C attached and then give like a page number, page one or two or three. Uh, makes it a little easier to change from year to year. All right, uh, Jason Buckingham Bryce, uh, 
Who would you like the request for LEP and poverty maximum amounts to be addressed to? Jen or myself could for sure give you that answer. I think probably most of them on the team here would be capable of finding that, but I would probably start with Jen or myself. Thank you. So I'm expecting about 62 emails when we get back to our guests. <laughs> Well, and I have shared this with the districts as yeah. I've been out. I've talked to them about this is what you're asking for, and this is what we've calculated for the last three years. So 101 districts have received this information. Yeah, it's, it's not that we're trying to hide the information. It's just a matter of it looks kind of bad if the design of the poverty LAP plans was for districts to submit what they thought they needed, and we're saying, well, that may be what you think you need, but you should go ahead and request this amount because it's more. It just that, that's the reason we haven't posted it out there. It just kind of has a bad look to it if we say, you know, this is this is what you should do, even if you only need uh, a lesser amount. So that's why we don't post it out there. But again, we glad we're we're more than happy to help schools if we can. So that's that's why we've taken the approach we have. Uh, other ways to use poverty and LEP funding is what we would talk about as well. Um, whether that's developing um, your programs or technology, maybe you're going to go to a one-on-one -on -one initiative. Um, as long as it supports the entire school plan, um, it's, that would be a good thing. Uh, building capacity, full staff development, building resources for your school district, um, expanding the school time, summer school, before school, after school, jumpstart, um, even a pre-K if you're going to expand into that. Um, and then level the playing field. Uh, not all kiddos can afford the ACT or SAT prep. Help them out there to kind of level that playing field so that they have the, the same advantages. Um, dual credit courses would be another thing. Maybe they can't afford the, the tuition to do that. Help them out there. Um, and even activities. Um, I know a lot of smaller schools buy like a tuba. Um, you could sure loan that out to a kid that maybe couldn't afford one on his own. Uh, here's that resources page that I talked about earlier. Um, here's the links for the calculations. Those are on our web page. Um, we also have the poverty and LEP web pages for resource guides. Those were just updated last year. Here's the link to the GMS website now um, where you would upload your LEP and poverty uh, plans for 1819 coming up. And the Rule 15 Inflammation Guide for LEP is also here. Of course, if you have any questions, give us a holler. Um, that's all I had for today. You have any other questions for me? All right. If not, I'll turn it over to Janice. Well, good morning. My turn to talk, and I can pick on Bryce this time. I'm last. You're last. But... He talks about jokes. We do encourage schools to send jokes in, and we actually are, we'll probably do something for that and give some good ones. We bought him a, a joke book. He's not using it. He thinks he can come up with his own on his own. So please help us out in that way, because he keeps us captive with his jokes. He tries them out on us. So we, have, we would like to share the pain. So, <laughs> so as far as the budget and LT2 materials, got those things posted. There's our website at the bottom. The budget text, we did have to make a change this morning to it. So if you have a, if you downloaded that already, you want to pull it down again and get a, the newest version of that. The budget timelines are out there now. And Dan talked about them briefly. I don't think they don't want to change. There's only a small change to the number. Oh, okay. The only change in the budget text is with the hearing notice with the four days. Because that was a change in statute. And that's the only thing that's really changed. So if you've got it... And you're not worried about that piece, you're fine, everything else is the same. We've got the timelines, as Deanne talked about. Um, August 20th is your next timeline that's coming up. You can watch it for your evaluations to be posted or emailed to you. We also have the templates for expenditure exclusions and the filing deadlines for state board approval. Bill's going to talk about that more in depth, but that information is out there. And we also have a link on our site to take you to the APA site so you can pull down your budget documents. I'm going to talk a little bit about the LC2 right now. Um, 
It's not available yet. You can get to it, but the activation code haven't been loaded yet. We're still finishing up the testing in that piece. We'll hopefully have it out yet this like later today, if possible. Um, remember that the activation codes are changed every year, and if you do have two schools that you're in charge of, it was different. You would have to get separate activations for each district. The upload budget file button, we don't we don't think they've been using it quite enough because it came across a few budgets that had to be amended because you file it, put the information up, and have not updated it as you made changes to the budget because a few of them went over on their budget authority or cash reserves this past year. So make sure you use the LT2. That's what it's been, it's out there for to protect you from having to go back and have a amended hearing two day or like two weeks after you've adopted it. You don't want to be doing that. And again, whenever you make a change to the budget, you make sure you can upload that into the LT2. If you have any issues with the portal, you need to get in contact with the help desk. And there's three ways to get the hold of them. The phone numbers listed above. Um, here's a link to their email and also at the right hand upper right hand corner of the portal page, the front page, there's a link that you can put in a request for some help. And it doesn't make any difference if you try all three different managers, you're going to be still put in the same queue and you'll, they'll get to you when they're able to because they're pretty busy right now with all the different uh, collections that are going on right now. The top part of the LC2 on our line schools, this is where you are able to access whatever unused budget authority that you've carried over from the previous years. Most schools don't have much anymore, but a few do. And it really is a benefit for those districts whose budget authority is certified based on their previous year's budgets, the budget based, or that have the two that are student growth. Because this pulls that amount into your base and carries forward to for future years. You have to manually enter that number into line A355, you see across, we do have, I circled that, so you can see that's the max you can put in there. So if you put a number that's higher than that, you're going to get an error message that comes along. But make sure and look and, and see if you do have that, because you need to be able to access and pull that into your base. Because of, you know, the legislature's looking at school spending, and if you want to protect your budget authority, this is one way to do that. I mentioned before a little bit more reminders about the LC2. It's you it's used to confirm that your budget meets the spending limitations of the allowable reserve percentage each year. This is one way to make sure that you do not adopt something that is outside of your limitations. So a good check to do before you do put that hearing notice in the paper is to upload your budget one last time into the LC2 and make sure that it matches what you have on the hearing notice. Here are the, we've got a few error messages and if you have an error message you're not able to submit that LC2. So if you put an amount in that A355 that exceeded the amount that's on the left hand side of the page you won't be able to upload it or approve it. The budget authority, if you exceeded the amount that's calculated by the LC2, you'll get an error message. And then if you go over your allowable reserve percentage, you'll get that uh, error message as well. This year, we have added a new function to the LC2 where you can actually upload the budget to the, the Department of Education. And I want you to know that this is the only way we will accept them this year. It's similar to how district audits were uploaded to the AFR online system this past fall. So we're getting this information electronically. When you do this, you will get an email that lets you know that you have, we've received your budget documents. And what I mean by budget documents, I, I'm talking about the supporting documentation actually, the budget, the certification evaluation that you get from the counties, group publications, and board minutes to be part of that package. If you don't have it all together when you want to upload it, you can upload it to different files at different times. You can do that. This piece shows up after you click the district approval button. And so we 
you click that button, you'll see this. If you don't want to upload at that time, you don't have to. You can back out and then come back later, and it appears at the top of the LC2. A note to remember, we only access, we can only get PDFs, and we do have a file limit that you can upload, and it's listed right under that two file button. Sometimes when schools are budgeting, they're realizing they don't have enough budget authority. So schools do have the ability to go to vote the people in your district to ask them if you can exceed the certified budget authority by certain amounts. This provides you more budget authority for just one school fiscal year, but it carries on to future school years. So really this is what schools that have their budget authority based on their certified on their budget based and the student growth would help them because they're the ones who are really sometimes needing more budget authority. Be sure if you decide to do something like that, that the ballot language has to include some information that you're accessing all expenditure exclusions that are allowable by statute to school districts. And the amount that you're going to ask for is your SPED, as your SPED budget and your special grant fund list. All that information has to be included. If you have any questions, you're thinking about doing this, give us a call and we can walk you through it and see if it's something you actually want to do. It doesn't happen very often, but some schools do look into this option if they're short on budget authority. A few budgeting reminders I'd like to bring out is the state aid amount. When you put that information into your budget worksheet for the general fund, make sure that you're using the total state amount, state aid amount, I'm sorry. Um, We've had it where you put the school district has put in the state aid amount, but did not include the piece that had the prior year correction. So make sure you're using the final line that's on your state aid certification document. Motor vehicle taxes, taxes as you know, don't go down. So they shouldn't be less than you um, had budgeted for in the previous year. So kind of keep those constant. You can be pretty close, but you don't want to go like $75,000 less because that's, that's going to throw some questions because that number is put out on the summary pages for the adopted budget. The beginning and ending balances is important because that kind of helps you adjust what you want to ask in taxes. And if you're looking at being short on money, say in like March or April when your tax receipts are lower or before you get your first half of your taxes, you might consider wanting to have a, a lower beginning and beginning balance for the 17-18 year so that you can have a little bit of a higher tax request. That play comes into play with that. If you have questions how it works, give us a call. The county treasurer's balance, a lot of times you get a phone call about that, like how do you determine what that's going to be? Should I call the county treasurer to get that information? Well, if you do that, your county treasurer is going to say, we don't know what you're going to have by the end of the year. Because you're working on your budget right now here in July and August. We're looking at the ending balances September 1st or like August 30th. They don't know what it's going to be. So your best bet is to look at what's been what you've gotten in the past years. Like look at your audit, you know, 15, 16 year else. Look what you started with at the beginning of the 16, 17 year. That's your best way to make an estimate for that. A little bit about the budget worksheets. We want to encourage you to make sure that you're using the worksheets only. Don't start keying information into summary pages because what's going to happen, those formulas aren't going to work and the information is not going to flow correctly from your worksheets to the summary pages. Every year we get a phone call from a superintendent or a business manager saying, these numbers aren't working right. Well, it's likely because you may have accidentally maybe did a space when you're in a cell on the summary pages and that blows the whole thing, you have to start over. And nothing's worse than us having to tell you that you have to start over and key all that information in again. So just don't even go to the summary pages. Leave that alone until your worksheets are done. I might mention that if you have entered a whole bunch of information and you're having problems with a formula or something, um, you can send that to me by email electronically. Um, I have I do have the ability to open that file, make changes or adjustments, and then send it back to you. Uh, obviously, I don't want every school to do that, 
But if it is a case where you spent, you know, hours putting things in and you really don't want to have to start over, um, I would encourage you to send it. I would, we will not give out the password because the password would allow everyone to have access and that we use that as a risk monitoring that we know certain formulas are the same and that nobody's gone in and changed anything. So I will not give you the password to correct an, a formula error, but if you send it to me electronically, I can fix things and send it back to you. Well, that's good news. Because I don't ever like to tell superintendents you got to start over. So, yeah, thank you. That's good. Cool. Here's a, a a piece that you want to make sure that you you know look over closely before you send in your budgets. After you've had your hearing and adopted it, you want to make sure that ending and beginning balances match. And the way I've laid it out on the screen here is what I actually do when I'm looking at those things. I'll take the budget. From 16 17 year, and I'm pulling page four, which is the actual page, and making sure that ending balance matches what you're starting the 15 16 actual page. And they should match. If they don't, you're going to get that sent back to you. The auditors will are pretty good about sending that back. It's easier to get this taken care of before you actually submit. If you have a question, if you look at it, you have a problem, give us a call and we can help you through. Allowable reserves, and Deanne talked about a little bit with this piece with cash reserves. And the cash reserve for the general fund and depreciation fund and the employee benefit cash reserve in that fund are part of the allowable reserves. And it's the max that you can have, and you, schools are all certified and allowable reserve percentage, and that's based on their ADM, so their kid count basically. It's important to make sure that you do have a cash reserve in the general fund because as Deanne talked about, your taxes, you're not going to get your taxes for the year that you're taxing for, for 17, 18. You're not going to get that until May. So you're actually living the majority of your, first, of your school year on the second half of your taxes from the previous year. So to protect yourself, you need to really ask for more in your cash reserve. We always suggest that schools budget at least two to three months of expenses to have that amount in there. And keep in mind, your percentage covers all three of these components of the allowable reserves. So sometimes at the end of the year, you're going to make a transfer to your depreciation fund if you have unspent budget. And that's a good idea, but make sure that you don't put so much over there into the depreciation fund that limits the amount that you can have in your general fund cash reserve. So here's an example of a school district that have a $10, $10 million budget. And their school district are probably about 800 students or so. Their allowable percentage, or reserve percentage, is 35%. And so the most that they can budget between those three fund, those three components is $3.5 million. So that includes going back to this slide is that's the most you can put in the general fund cash reserve, the depreciation fund, and the cash reserve you put in the general fund for the employee benefits fund. Other all the other cash or other cash reserves in the other funds are limited to 50% of the total budget that you might put in together. The budget hearings and I'm kind of going over the same information that Deanne has. You've got the four days before the hearing. It has to be in the paper. You're not counting the day of the hearing. You've got three different required hearings. One to adopt the budget, one to set the, the tax request, and one to amend the budget if you find out you have some funds that are having a lot more activity than you expected. As, you, as she mentioned, you don't have to hold that meeting. You don't have to approve it. The budget or the tax request the same day as your hearing. So the process would be to open the hearing, you're going to provide the hearing information to those patrons available, which means a copy of the budget, the hearing notice information, you may have questions, and then you'll close that hearing. If you happen to have the tax request hearing the same day, you'll follow that with follow your budget hearing with the tax request hearing. You'll open it. You'll provide that information 
tax information that you're asking for, and you'll take questions, take information, concerns from your public, and then close it, close that hearing. And then when you do have the board hearing to make that, to vote on it, you'll do that during the meeting. You don't do that during the hearings. Sometimes you'll have your hearing and you'll submit it and come across an error in the budget. If there's not a change of more than 1% or the property tax doesn't increase, you don't have to have a hearing, but you've got 30 days to correct that with board action. So you got 30 days after you found that error in your budget that you've adopted, or after the AD, APA has gotten in contact with you. You got 30 days. So if you get that taken care of within 30 days, you don't have to have a hearing. The tax request resolution is what you're going to be filing on October 13th. The 15th is a Sunday, so this will be Friday, the last day. Most schools do hold their tax request hearing the same day as their uh, budget hearing, so you should have plenty of time to get that information to the county clerk. And it's going to specify the tax dollars that you're requesting for each tax increment. We do have an example of one as an appendix mm -hmm. in the uh, budget text, so you can go back there and pull that out and give you something to start with. If you don't want to change, if you want to change, you might want to. Have your audit, your, I guess your attorney look it over and see if they agree with what changes you put together. So this is the time of year that you're probably going to be should be looking at your 16, 17 budget and make sure that you have enough spending authority in each year funds before the end of the school year because it has to be done before August 31st. Sometimes the activities and lunch fund are a lot of times, those are the ones that are uh, frequently amended at, toward the end of the year. If you're thinking about refinancing your bonds to get a lower interest rate, you have to amend your bond fund for that. That would be for both funds. It would be a qualified cap fund or the bond fund. Sometimes you get building projects going on and there's some more expenditures than what you anticipated. This is the time you want to look at that type of activity and make sure you're not going to be going over on your special building fund. This applies to all funds that you have. So if you because you're you've asked for say a million dollars for your building fund. If you happen to think you're going to go you're getting pretty close, get in there and amend it. And if you check all your funds, if you then you can do all that in one hearing to amend. When you do amend it, you're going to have to publish that hearing notice four days prior to the hearing. After the hearing has been approved, then you're going to submit the proof of publication, board minutes, and page two of the budget document to the APA, to the Department of Education, and the county clerks. Remember, if you do amend your general fund or depreciation fund or the cash reserve and the employee benefit fund, your LC2 is impacted likely have to amend that as well. Give us a call if that's something you need to do and we can help you do that as well. Got a few put together a budgeting checklist, the things to think about as you start working with this. Have you looked and seen if you needed to ask or request budget authority for expenditure exclusions? Make sure those have been sent in. Bill's going to talk about that a little bit later. Make sure you use the LC2 while you're working with the budget. So when you make changes and tinker with what your, your expenditures are, you want to make sure and upload that into the LC2 again. Is your budget with them, the spending and levy and reserve limits? Before you publish that hearing notes, make sure that your LC2 and budget match. Because you don't want to publish something that shows you is going over your budget authority. Got the four day notice for the publishing your hearing notice. Um, Connie's asking Deanne, did you say something about OPS publishing their notice of budget hearing already? Like, no, about I, LPS. LPS. Well, LPS. Yeah. I've not seen anything Lincoln. from OPS. Uh, and then another question from Brian Should the LPS be available now? LC2. In the board? Yeah. 
the SLC2, whatever, same thing, right? Um, should the LC2 be available now in the portal? We're just completing our testing with it today. We've had some issues that's come up. Um, we plan on trying to get that out yet today, later today, so come back and check that. But it's not at this moment. Right now it's not. Soon. Coming soon. Coming soon. Coming soon. Hopefully today. There's another statement coming that you can go ahead and okay. copy notifying. Make sure, too, that your, once you put that in the paper, pick up the newspaper first thing in the morning where it should be published when you anticipate. Make sure it actually gets published because that's happened. It seems like every year we get a comment from a superintendent. Now what? So that's why, and this is just repeating what Deanne talked about, that's why you don't want to wait to the last minute to put your hearing in the paper. Give yourself some room. You know, don't do it on the 18th, like when it's, if it is a Monday before that you have the hearing. You have to submit it on the 20th. So do it like at least the week before so that make sure it does get in the paper. After the, there. After you have the board approval, you're going to go in and uh, approve the LC2 and then You'll also submit all of budget information to the department through the LC2, the APA, and to the counties. You're going to submit that tax resolution to the county by the 13th of November, October, and then make sure when they post it to the county, let you know what your tax request has been set at. Make sure it's correct because November 5th, you have no more chances to get that correct. All right. Harlan's got a question. Um, if we refinance a QC pub, does that mean we fall under the new law and could no longer ask for the 5.2 cents? I, I would say no, because it's based on the project that you already passed. So what you're talking about is just the financing of that QC pub. So you would still, if the project was approved prior to the law that changed last year, last year, two years, ago, last year, last year, April, um, yeah, then you're still good. So you don't have to worry about that. But you you know, you're gonna amend your budget, you're gonna to have to go in and make sure and yeah. have a hearing to amend. A few last reminders I want to talk about. If you do have spending authority that remains in the general fund, so say you your your year to date spending year is eighty five percent and you wanna make a transfer and maximizing your budget for the general fund, you can make those transfers to these funds. Appreciation Fund, Employee Benefit Fund, the School Nutrition Fund, and the Activity Fund. But caution, I want to caution you that you don't put too much into the Depreciation Fund so that you're not caught in kind of a, you've got too much there and you want to have, your, you're limited in what you can have in your tax reserve because you're limited by that allowed reserve. So keep that in mind. If you're short on money at the end of the year, you were like in 16, 17, and got into say April and you're pretty short, you may not want to make a transfer if you've got unspent budget left in the general fund. You might want to keep that in because that's going to increase what you start the 17, 18 year in your general fund cash balance. Again, repeating what Deanne said, make sure that the county has set your levy correctly. November 5th is the drop dead time. You can't change it after that point. So with that, I'm going to send it over to Bill. Any questions for Janice before I get started, guys? Okay. All right, I will go over expenditure exclusions and the levy exclusions that we currently have. Um, what these do is it will allow the school district to uh, go over the dollar five in a roundabout way. And uh, most of them need approval uh, through the state board. And I will handle all of that. The exclusions that are available currently that do not need approval from the state board, it would be your SPED budget, and then the majority of them on the special grant fund list, we have already put that together and presented it to the state board in May, so there's no need for you to get approval again when you use it in your LC2. 
the, the, at the bottom of the LC2, there are seven grants that have an asterisk next to them. Uh, those still do need approval from the state board, so you will send me a, uh, via email, a letter just describing which of the seven you're uh, wanting to use, uh, the amount that you're asking for, and just like a brief description of what you're going to use it for. Uh, I will then present it to the board and they will approve it. Uh, please make sure it's signed by the superintendent and on school letterhead or district letterhead, I guess. Um, the seven are insurance settlements, interfund loans, reimbursements for awards of the courts, uh, repayments of county governments for previous overpayments, short-term borrowings, the special supplementary grants from city or county government, and then special supplementary grants that you may have received from corporations, foundations, or other private interests. The following five uh, listed here, again, would be sent in to me uh, if, the, if your district qualifies, and then that amount would be entered into the district's base or uh, the total allowable budget authority on your LC2. It's going to be in that box A, uh, so it sticks with you. It's not a one-year uh, increase. It gets uh, built into that base. Uh, those fives are the data transmission network exclusion, new elementary attendance sites, the early childhood education. Um, okay. Uh, Jana says the reorg piece doesn't work, so now it's actually four. And then the retirement incentive staff development. Uh, this is a brief description of the data, data transmission network exclusion. Uh, big part is, is you want to work with your ESU on estimating the costs, and then they would fall in the object code of 284 on your AFR. New elementary attendance site is the next one. Um, it's an exclusion for all costs related to the first year of a new elementary site. Uh, below are a idea of what you can use uh, for the costs. The early childhood education grants. Um, we will pro we provide you with that number. Um, Dottie asks, does this include a new pre-K building? No, it has to qualify basically for the elementary site allowance. This is not like the larger school districts who are growing and adding new elementary buildings. It's really for those buildings who have, those school districts who have consolidated in the past and had elementary sites open in different locations and then maybe closed one of those sites and then decided to reopen one of them. So there's some pretty strict stipulations on who qualifies for that. And I don't think we've actually had any use that or qualify for that um, exclusion. All right, so the early childhood education grant, um, that is calculated here at the departments and then we send it out to the districts that have qualified um, and then they again send that back into me saying they want to use it and then we uh, add it into their base in the section A section of their LC2. The retirement incentive staff development, that is for um, and only can be used by newly merged or reorganized districts. So that um, we don't usually see that too often. Every couple, three years, we'll have a couple districts merged together. So West, West Boyd and Lynch. And Lynch, if you are listening, you may want to contact us on that. All right, on the Schedule A of your budget documents, the following six um, exclusions are there. These are yearly. You will have to um, 
ask for them every year. And again, it's uh, it's an email to me. Uh, there's a couple, the voluntary term and the retirement contribution are uh, templates that we provide. The remaining uh, need to have a, a letter on district letterhead sent to me with the amount and the description of what it's for. And then again, I will uh, submit to the board to get it approved. Now we'll go over those six on a little more in depth. Um, sadly, we've had some of this recently, so this one may be get used this year. Uh, repairs for to infrastructure damaged by uh, natural disaster. Uh, to qualify, first and foremost, it must be declared a disaster by the governor or FEMA. Uh, and then with the recent flooding or tornadoes, um, they would qualify for that. Then we have the judgments not covered by liability insurance. Um, district must have a judgment entered against it that uh, obligates the district to pay a judgment out. Um, but this does not include orders from the Commission of Industrial Relations. If your district does offer distance education courses, uh, you provide the, through the ESU Coordinating Council to other schools or districts, and it is for the exact amount of what is received as payment from that other school and or district. Voluntary termination, there's been a lot of changes to this um, in the late, latest legislative session. Um, Jan has put in a lot of hours getting this template perfected. Um, hopefully it uh, makes sense to all of you that use it. Um, but at the end of the day, it eliminates the exclusions resulting from voluntary termination uh, agreements resulting from a collective bargain agreement uh, prior to this September 1st of 2017. Um, and the incentives for certificated staff can include uh, insurance coverage for the, that staff member or any member of their uh, immediate family. The big thing here with all these changes is it all revolves around that collective bargaining agreement. So what happens there is after September 1st of this year, the um, exclusion, the incentives cannot exceed $35,000 uh, per teacher, or I'm sorry, per person. Uh, the incentives have to be paid within five years or prior to becoming eligible for Medi Medicare, whichever one of those comes first. And then there is a document or a section on the template uh, where you guys have to fill out what the five-year savings would be uh, for that uh, terminated employee salary and benefits. And again, uh, this person, the certificated teacher, cannot be included in a collective bargaining agreement if you have one. All right, so changes uh, provisions related to district budgeting. Um, voluntary termination exclusions, the CBAs, it's for certificated employees. Um, and it's included certificate collective bargaining agreements in place prior to uh, September 1st of this year. Um, retirements have to occur prior to September 1st to get 100% of the incentives uh, used for your exclusion for the school year. Uh, retirements happening after September 1st uh, decrease each year. It's 75% uh, for this upcoming school year, 50% for the following year, 25% for 1920, and then nothing for 2021. And then Dale asked if we received a preschool grant for the upcoming school year for a new preschool, can we claim an exemption right away? That will be on the special grant fund list, that you can get that exclusion. 
So yes. Yes. <laughs> All right, the retirement contribution increase uh, exclusion, same as last year and previous years. Um, the difference of the 2.53 percent is is what you're looking at. Native American Impact Aid, this only applies to the native schools, but it allows those native schools um, to receive an exclusion uh, to help them out. And on this slide, the our web address is there at the top, and then down at the bottom is a um, where our templates that are already that have been created uh, are available. For the state of board approval process, um, just for the Janice and mine sanity, please on everything you do for us, round everything to the nearest dollar. That way we're not worrying about any rounding errors or discrepancies, uh, budget, AFR, all that good stuff, please round. Um, include your exclusions in the budget uh, prior to state board approval. We have yet to see any of them get denied, so put them in now, um, even if you don't have the approval sent uh, back to you. Uh, and then verify, once, you had, once it has passed that board meeting, verify the amount. Um, just to make sure that there's no discrepancies from what you submitted and what got approved. Uh, this essentially gives you my contact information. Um, email is the fastest and easiest way to get it to me, and then I can get in there. I, I will respond saying that I will get submitted, and I will try and include which board meeting it will be improved in in that response for me. Uh, something new this year, um, previously our SFOS email address would uh, notify you with your exclusion that it was approved. Um, that will no longer happen. Uh, the website, again, is, is included here. And then if you look down below where the arrow is pointing, if you click on that, it will change each month for the current state board approvals and that will uh, usually be updated the Friday by the Friday following uh, the state board meeting so about a week uh, after that here's the timeline uh, the left column is when I would be the deadline for when I would need to have the request the board meeting is on the right um, again, the amounts that you're asking for can be included uh, with your budget prior to getting approval. Just verify that the amount approved is what you have in your budget. All right, so now we're down to the levy limitation. Uh, everybody's levy, again, must be at $1.05 or less. The three le uh, funds that are included in that dollar five letter, the general fund, the special building, and the QC puff. And again, the exclusions allow the district to be over that dollar five, and you will see them on the Schedule B of your budget documents. Uh, Schedule B does have a new look, like Deanne mentioned earlier, but at the end of the day, you're still looking at Schedule B for those exclusions. The exclusions that uh, are on your levy on the Schedule B will be the voluntary termination agreements uh, with certificated employees, the judgments not covered by liability insurance, and bonded indebtedness. Here's a list of all the exclusions and just how it's broken down. As you can see, there are two that are levy exclusions and expenditure exclusions. Uh, five total uh, exclusions are available for the levy, and then I think it's 12 or 14 
listed there for expenditure exclusions that you can use. And now it's time for the great Bryce Wilson to talk. Uh, Mark, somebody is typing a question. So. Well, before I get started on all the fun stuff uh, that I get to talk about, that I get the uh, hornet's nest all going again. Um, and Mark does ask, sorry, Bryce, uh, uh, that he sees that the webinar is in, it will be recorded. It will be available. Um, you'll see on our website it will be a, a link. Um, not Netflix, sorry, Mark. But the series almost is as cool. coming soon. <laughs> well, it'll be almost as cool because we do have a YouTube page. So the link will be on our website to said YouTube channel because with Bryce's awesome Twitter uh, account, we will also now have a YouTube channel where the webinars and other Zoom meetings uh, moving forward will be posted for. Yeah, maybe. maybe. I mean, yeah. this all weighs on Bryce's shoulders. So, uh, as, as 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 Bill is talking about too, this is the last year we'll be using um, the Adobe Connect for this meeting. We'll be using uh, Zoom next year. So, uh, but that will all be available out there still. Uh, yeah. So before I get started on the annual financial report stuff. Um, that we're going to talk about, and there is a lot of new information there that I want to make sure people get and are aware of. Um, I wanted to go back to the LEP poverty plan stuff. Um, one thing I think that's important, I guess the advice or the recommendation that I give uh, people when talking about the LEP and poverty plans and how to submit, and whether you're cal using the calculated amount or uh, the submitted amount by your district, I think really the best approach when you're doing that isn't necessarily going with a calculated amount or getting that amount, I, I understand that can be helpful when you know that amount from us, but really the best solution is to come up with the poverty plan that's best for your district um, that includes the bells and whistles that you'd like to do for those kids because the problem you can run into if you're just submitting a calculated amount that's way larger than what you've been submitting is if you get, if you get that calculated amount, you then have to spend 117.65% of that amount. So if that's a big increase, you all of a sudden, you know, if you were getting 100,000 for your poverty plan, all of a sudden that jumps up to 500,000. You better have a way to spend 117.65% of that. If you don't have a plan or you don't have enough poverty kids to put something in place like that, you're going to end up with a correction two years down the road that's going to do more harm than that good. So um, you're better off just to come up with a plan that includes the bells and whistles and everything you'd like to do for those poverty kids. I, I understand. There's a little bit of, um, if, if you get the money, you'll figure out a way to, to uh, spend it. Um, I think a little bit of Americans were, uh, were raised to uh, know how to figure that out. But, um, but really, I think the best approach is, is figuring out what can you do for those kids and then submit a plan that corresponds to that in dollars amount. That way, you don't get yourself into a situation where you can't spend what you got. So keep that in mind. But again... Uh, we will give you that calculated amount, and I understand that can be a little bit helpful, too, when you're determining that information. So with that, I am going to start going through the annual financial report. I'm going to start easy um, <laughs> with what with our update for just this current year. Um, the new AFR or the, the new user's manual is going to come out here shortly uh, and what that will look like. And, and just before we get everybody too excited... Uh, that will be very similar to what you've seen in the past. Uh, no big changes. We'll start it um, at the top with all the new account codes that will come in for just this year, which is minimal at this point. Um, it, it, remember, it's not until the 18-19 school year that we're going to have the significant changes, what we will talk about in just a second. Uh, that new online system, the one change uh, that's significant in design, I guess, is what it's going to look like when, when it's displayed. So. The upload function will still be the same. It'll still be an AFR spreadsheet. Uh, it'll still be on the portal, and uh, that will still be uploaded the same way. But what you're going to see once it's uploaded, uploaded is going to be different. It's going to look a little bit more like this. Uh, it's going to show a current year and a prior year column with the differences there, both in percent and dollar amounts. Um, and then that last column, you'll see an alerts column to hopefully 
I guess, identify potential issues that exist. Um, basically, what we're trying to do here is we're really trying to catch those errors and mistakes on the front end instead of catching them after state aid is certified and everybody's saying, oh, no, uh, we had a big decrease in state aid. What happened here? So if you see some big changes there, hopefully that will alert you to those uh, issues and, and at least give you an opportunity to look at and say, yeah, that's correct or no, it's not correct. So uh, those alerts will not necessarily have to be corrected, but it's something to flag them and hopefully catch your attention. Uh, along with that, I guess I would say the good news, or maybe really not so much good news, is there's no changes yet on that AFR online system and probably not coming, that even with the new AFR, you're still going to have to complete poverty and LEP narratives. Um, basically, those are statute requirements, so that's not going away anytime soon. Um, even if you don't receive the poverty allowance, but you do receive title funding, you are required to complete those poverty narratives, so make sure you're getting that done in there. Um, again, it's not, a, it's not a complete submission of the AFR to us until those are submitted. Uh, just going to go through a couple of clarifications on the new account codes. Um, this one not being new, but the next ones will be. Uh, this is just a clarification. We're still, we are aware that we still have districts doing things differently. It's always, I guess, a constant struggle to try and get everybody on the same page when, when you have 244 school districts now. Uh, that, that will be a challenge, I suppose, until the end. So um, the 382 object code, which is the distance education telecommunication, um, should only include costs for services. It should not include purchases of equipment or infrastructure um, costs. So I guess we, again, had districts doing that differently. Make sure you're only including your services in there. It is a component of TIOSA, so it is important that we have people doing it the same way so that it's as fair as possible. Uh, new account codes you're going to see for um, on this upcoming user's manual to be released here soon. You're going to see a, a 1280 Special Education Unified Sports account code, which is basically uh, a new thing where districts are having, uh, and probably most of you are more familiar with this than we are, but uh, sports where they have the special education kids competing with the regular education kids um, alongside each other. And, Doing that, so that's 1280. Uh, the expense code, uh, the extended extended learning opportunity grants. You'll see a 3590, both disbursement and receipt codes. So it'll show up on both sides. And then 5100 is IDA maintenance of effort non-compliance recovery. So if you did not meet maintenance of effort and have to pay some back, that will go through the 5100 account code. Uh, 1290 was the early childhood sped account code for disbursements um, that's getting split into two different separate account codes, 1291, 1292, uh, which is basically just ages 0 to 2 and ages 3 to 5. Basically, federal reporting guidelines are requiring us to report those uh, separately or break them out. And so you will see that done. And 1235, tuition paid from other districts for preschool sped. And the big one I want to talk about is just 3132. This is for that personal property tax credit that is new this year. Uh, you're going to stick those receipts in that in 3132. Also, a one-time credit, I guess, this year that happened, and it's only going to happen one time, so don't get too excited about seeing it every year, um, is the railroad property tax credit. So it's only occurring this year. You're receiving, you should be receiving that or have already received that. Um, since it's a one-time, one-year thing, we're going to have you stick that in, in that 3132 receipt code as well this year, um, and then that will go away. So it will just be personal property tax credit in that after this year. Right, so concerning 3590 there, Harlan is questioning, is that 3590 for 21st century, or do we continue to use the 4968 function code? It would not be for the 21st century. You would continue to use the, the 21st century account codes there. So. All right, now for the part that, um, if you can tell on the screen, I used to have more hair and it's quickly falling out. Um, this is all due to, it's not due to Janice actually, as some think. Um, it is mostly due to the 2018-19 um, redo of the annual financial report. Um, this is, for those that haven't heard, I'm, I'm guessing most of you have heard by now, you should have received emails 
from us and, and seen the information on our website by now. Um, if you were part of the pilot, dis the pilot districts or pilot group that we worked with on this um, and, and will continue to work with, we thank you for your help. Uh, I will say that the pilot group was very influential in, in decisions made and uh, had a big role in, in what I won't say the final product, product is because I don't think we're at a final product. We're at a point where we're trying to roll it out and move forward with it. Um, we realize that we have a ways to go yet and we will continue to um, try to make this work as best as we can for, for everybody involved. Um, again, we know this is a lot of work for the school districts. It's a lot of work for us, uh, but it is a requirement. And, and actually the great news that I got while during this webinar is uh, we officially got notification from the, the Federal Department of Education that we can officially start this for the 2018-19 school year. We were operating under an original assumption, an original guidance that got repealed that said that we would be able to get a waiver to start in 1819. Um, but that guidance was repealed when the Trump administration came on. And so we were still moving forward with 1819, even though um, the guidance was saying 1718, just realizing that that wasn't even a possibility at that point anymore in April. Um, so again, official. Uh, guidance just during this webinar that says yes 1819 they're going to allow districts to or, or states to start submitting school building level information in 1819 so that's what the big change is um, in 1819 we have to start per ESSA requirements collecting expense information at the school building level um, that does mean even if you are a building a K through 12 school uh, so one of our smaller districts across the state You'll still have to break it out between elementary and high school, uh, whatever your grade configuration is that you submit uh, for your elementary, that will be split out. So uh, this is a big change and uh, it's a lot of work, but um, a necessary requirement. <laughs> so there's a lot of things we're doing with this to, again, work with school districts to make sure that we're trying to consider everything we can. Um, one of those things that we are looking into and, and trying to line up right now is um, some kind of roundtable discussion to happen out at Administrator Days. Basically, um, we're looking for some space to find uh, the Tuesday afternoon before all the activities can kick off on Wednesday. So maybe uh, Tuesday at 2-ish or something like that. We want to try and see if we're, we're looking to try and find some space out there where we can just get anybody that wants to talk about all these changes together and we can discuss it, hopefully answer some questions, maybe get some more information that will change what we're doing. We're open to your suggestions. If you want to email, call, talk through that with us. Um, as always, we're open to that discussion. So um, please do that. Again, you can find more information, what was emailed out on our website there. I have the link to, there, to that. Um, if you're an ESU listening, we are beginning work on a new ESU AFR. This may be a little more specific to ESUs. Um, that's in the very infant stages. We're not near as far along on that. Um, we've been focused mostly on the, the district uh, AFR at this point. So we right. have one question, Bryce, from Mark. Uh, it says, we currently have location codes for all gen ed expenses. What about district level specialists? Uh, will they need to be coded mm -hmm. to locations? Well, and there is guidance out on that website. Um, basically, with this ESSA requirements, one nice thing with that came down from the federal guidance is they allowed states to have some um, discretion on what would be considered a district level cost and what would be considered a building level cost. And so we did identify those out in spreadsheets of what is what, um, what's district level, what's building level. So things like um, superintendent salaries will be district level expenses where obviously teachers are going to get allocated out by building level. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions are gray areas um, and areas we've got a lot of pushback on and um, are really considering that how to move forward with the pushback and feedback, I should say, um, is the ways to allocate some of those district level costs that have to be allocated out to a building, um, things like maintenance and repair. So, you know, if we're looking at 
We, at this point, we have not provided guidance on exactly how to do that. I think what we're going to do is we're going to pr probably end up publishing recommendations on how those allocations should be done, um, but leave some discretion to school districts. I think that there's always going to be exceptions to the rule. So, for example, if you have a situation where you're trying to allocate out, you have one maintenance guy that goes to two different buildings, if you're a smaller district, and um, your high school building is a 1950s building and your elementary is a brand new building, it, it does not, even if they're the same square feet, it may not make sense in that situation to allocate that maintenance guy out by square feet because obviously your new building is going to have less maintenance and repair as your 1950s building. So um, I think it makes sense to leave some district discretion there, but we may, um, I guess it's been asked of us to provide some guidance on that. And I think that's probably where the direction will go. Um, we continue to work on that. So uh, let's see. So one of the questions that's come along too is, are we working with the vendors on this? Um, and yes, the answer to that is we have from the very beginning. Um, this process all started really back in November. Um, and we had, by I know early December, contacted these vendors, had meetings with them, um, conference calls, and discussed what we're talking about doing due to the size and increase in account codes. An AFR spreadsheet is no longer going to be an option to upload. Uh, basically, we're going to have to have uploads come out of your accounting software systems. Um, I do realize that some of the very small districts have don't even have all their funds in software systems right now. They're still running some on paper. Um, what I'll tell you is, unfortunately, I think you're going to have to upgrade um, and get those systems into electronic form and possibly upgrade if you're using very old versions of QuickBooks or something like that. You're going to have to probably upgrade your accounting software to um, a newer version that will be able to upload into our system and then provide a file. Um, a question that's come up many times too and again addressed on our website is, you know, we have to change all of our account codes. Um, hopefully you should be able to work with, hopefully you are by this point working with your software vendors to create if you're not wanting to change account codes to match all the new account codes we have put out there, um, you're working with them to create crosswalk documents for you because it will need to be submitted in our format. Uh, but you can still, you still have the um, ability to can keep track of your financial account codes at your district level. However, you need to do it for your purposes. We realize districts have different needs of that information, and so it's going to look different for everybody. That's okay. It just at the end of the day, when it's submitted to us, has to come in in our form. Uh, so I, one thing I did forget to mention is, is while we we're making all these changes and going to the building level uh, reporting, we we're also making some changes to line up our AFR with the federal account code structure, um, so that we figured um, this was the time we we're just going to go through all the pain at once, and that way um, we can make the transition. So again. Oh, that's not fun, not not exciting, creates issues of comparability and a lot of other things, but um, I guess a necessary evil. So if your if, if I should also mention if your software vendor is not on that list, please contact myself, Bill, um, or Janice and let us know. Um, I think that is the majority of what school districts are using. It's everybody that's reported, so there's a report. Uh, uh, school districts are supposed to submit to us um, that has who your software vendor uh, is. Not every school district submits that report. These are the ones that were submitted. So we, we contacted everybody we were aware of um, and, and that was reported to the department. If yours was not reported and it's not on this list, uh, you better be contacting them as soon as possible and we would like to contact them as soon as possible too uh, to make sure we can get everything in. So that's what I have right now on, on the new AFR. Again, um, open to more discussion on that, and we will make information available on that roundtable discussion as soon as possible. If you are part of our pilot group, it is very likely that you may get um, may have contact from us because we, we're likely going to want your participation um, in that discussion on the panel uh, to uh, discuss that. So. 
Changes to rule one, basically this is not a new change. This is what was thrown at you guys the last minute last year um, due to an audit finding we had. We had to address um, school district auditors testing of average daily attendance and average daily membership um, last minute before those audits occurred last year. So we sent out emails with what we were needing for documentation from those school district auditors. Now we have that information and basically the same requirements in rule. Um, it's updated, so they're, they're going to need to be testing that. Hopefully, uh, you've worked with them at this point on that. They can do that. Some of them are going to want to do that as a separate engagement from their regular audit. Others are doing this part of their regular school district audit. So um, we talked. I've talked through with the auditors on that, and they're. I guess some are just comfortable with different things on that. So whatever whatever works for them, we don't care as long as it gets reported. Holly says, uh, if we have an older version of Paris software, Fund Accounting 2, when do you suggest we update to app to fund? That's probably up to the software provider. Yeah, that's probably a better question for the software provider, but it, it depends on your budgeting and your, your schedule somewhat too. Um, I know a lot of school districts by January are going to be trying to budget, December, January timeframe are going to be budgeting using the new account codes. So, you know, I would think sooner as opposed to later, but obviously uh, you're probably best off talking to your software vendor on that, on that move forward. So, but if there is something we can do to help, we'd be glad to do that. Yeah, you know, it says now Russ would have told a corny joke, you're up, Bryce. Well, I was, th <laughs> I was thinking when I started here, you know, Russ had two paddles in his office all the time that were stained brown because he liked to stir stuff up um yeah i think he'd be real proud right now with how we're doing <laughs> with the new afr so um yeah we're uh, trying to follow in his footsteps still one thing just to mention in here um if you have audit findings from your your auditors um, one thing that makes the requirement to report those to us and your responses the the school district's response to those findings is just have the have your auditor if they will um, add the district response to their finding their uh, letter to management or compliance issues letter. So then just submit that all to us and it takes care of that requirement. Uh, just a, again a reminder this is not new anymore. It should be about the third or fourth year for you superintendents out there but make sure you get your, your new contract um, submitted to us before August 1st. That's the due date for that. Um, basically, we have to upload those on our website. Um, the upload location for you to submit those is in CDC in the portal. So, um, yeah, just make sure you get those updated. Again, if we don't have them by October 1st, then we have to go through a whole withholding of school district resources and all that stuff. And, and obviously, we don't want that to happen. So, um, just get, make sure you get your contracts uploaded. If you have questions on that, you can give me a call. Uh, census collection is currently open, right? Yeah. yeah. It just opened. Um, make sure you get that submitted. It's due by July 10th with the auto window of July 11th through 20th. Um, again, you can compare to prior years to make sure that you're getting, you have reasonable information there. So that's the count of district resident children ages 5 to 18 as of June 30th. Uh, so we, one of the big projects besides this AFR that we've been working on is a new online exempt school system so that exempt school parents can submit their forms um, and information online. I know a lot of you are saying, well, that doesn't really apply to us, doesn't matter. Um, what it does, what it is going to do is going to allow um, for us to provide an automated system that keeps track of when kids are or parents are in the process of submitting forms or have already submitted forms and we're going to provide uh, sometime in August we should have a system available um, hopefully early August before you're getting into your school year um, and checking on those exempt school kids to see okay if they didn't show up or did they file exempt we should have an online system you should quickly be able to go out and check um, hoping that makes the whole process a lot easier for you as school districts and then as, as the mid-year kids happen if you have a kid you know disappear all of a sudden um, if parents are filing reports, you should be able to track that and say, 
Uh, the, process, the system should show that the kid has started the process. They maybe haven't completed it yet, but you should be able to follow up on them, you know, as you need to periodically to make sure they get all their information in and you don't have a truancy issue. Yeah, so uh, my staff knows I love to give opportunities. Um, and and that's, it's not a good thing. <laughs> I guess that you can look at me giving a lot of opportunities around the AFR. Um, and actually, before I get into the budget assistance, too, I want to, I guess, give a heads up, too. We are, we are also working on uh, really just work around TIOSA and what that looks like and maybe what that should look like. Um, you know, potential rewrites and stuff. We recognize, fully recognize, that there is a lot of knowledge, um, experience, and expertise out across the state in superintendents and business officials, um, and we fully intend to tap into that resource um, when the time is appropriate. So be aware, I guess, as well, that that work is going on uh, and that we will be um, contacting some of you for your expertise and knowledge. So. All right, Bruce, here we go. John says, we have been told that a family, fam, that families that are previously homeschooled and then enrolled in our system have to themselves contact ND to rescind their exempt program approval. If on the new system we can verify the student's enrollment with our district, can that rectify or reconcile the record? We keep seeing kids listed on the exempt schools report who are attending our district and no longer homeschooled. Well, that's that's a great suggestion, John. I I don't know that we have discussed that option on the report, but as we're moving everything to electronic and uh, easier, that sure makes a lot of sense to me. So we will I will go back and discuss that with our team that's working on that system. Um, that may be something we can do to again just expedite the process and make it simpler for all. I mean. Um, I know some of you out there, I think, maybe think we're trying to make it difficult all the time, but we're really trying to make it easier for you. So budget assistant opportunities for the newbies out there or just the need that want um, us a second set of eyes on your budget, which I always think is a good idea just to have somebody else take a look. Um, we will be doing new superintendent orientations in North Platte on July 18th, um, again from 8.30 to 3 at the Holiday Inn Express. If you know of new superintendents or new business officials, please let them know that. Um, they need to, it would be great if they would register with us first so we have a good count and know that we have room. And um, if Janice wants to make sure everybody gets a roll, so we want to make sure we get those counts. But if for some reason they can't get registered in time, please still send them. Um, we're not going to turn anybody away. So in Lincoln, it's on July 20th, uh, same time period. It's just uh, the Lincoln Foundation building right here next to the state office building. So anybody and everybody is welcome to those. Uh, budget assistance out at administrator days, as has been the previous practice, um, we will be available both on the Wednesday and Thursday, pretty much all day from 8 in the morning till 4. And most likely, it says we'll be out for an hour over noon. Um, most likely we'll probably be, at least some of us will be around during that time as well. So come up and see us and we will be glad to go over your budget, help you with your budget. Um, or if you have other questions, if you want to talk about this AFR, if you want to talk about TIOSA, or any recommendations, suggestions you have, um, or anything else school finance related, LEP poverty plans, state aid, um, we should have people there and the ability to um, answer those questions hopefully. So. We'll be on the second level. They always kind of stick us up in a hide us in a room upstairs. So they don't they don't like to let accountants out much. Um, and then you can always send in your budgets. Your uh, email them to us. We'll go through them. Email you back, or you can email them in. Uh, then give us a phone call, and we can talk through those. Um, you can set up appointments to come in. Uh, Janice, Bill, and myself do a lot of that as well. Uh, you know, I think all three of us actually enjoy this time of year, so we enjoy actually getting to talk <laughs> talk through your budgets with you. So don't hesitate to do that. Uh, stop in. So, and then 
Um, as always, you know, follow along on Twitter. Try to get the information out there to you that's relevant um, as far as state aid or uh, budget or legislation issues. Um, we have the occasional dancing cat, which I'm pretty sure that cat didn't know about all the information I had to talk about, or he probably would have been playing dead, not dancing. Uh, but regardless, you can follow on Twitter, and we'll try to make sure you stay up to date. Um, hold on just a second, Bryce. Uh, Dottie wants to know how we sign up for the uh, new soup orientation sessions. We are sending out invitations, I believe, this week to schools that we know that are having new superintendents, but you get get in contact with it. It says email and we'll get that done too. And and yeah, just go ahead. Any any one of us contact us, we'll make sure you get on the list. So um, and new soups, feel free to bring your bookkeepers or whoever you want. Um, pretty much pretty much most people are welcome. We do have a couple of people on the list. So. Yeah. You're not fly list. Yeah. No, just kidding. Um, yeah. So other than that, uh, there's our contact information. And as always, if you'd like a couple thousand extra estate aid, submit your jokes to me. And uh, with that, we'll sign off for uh, the 2017 webinar. This will be, again, put out on our website soon. In a day or so. And so you can go back for your uh, listening pleasure. All right, we do. Okay, yeah. one more question coming. If you have any other questions, we'll stay on for a couple minutes. But thank you. It was Bryce's pleasure. <laughs> oh, good, Robbie did get on. We'll look forward to it, Tim. Don't forget the donuts. Whoa. That's not North Platte. Oh, not North Platte. You bring the donuts. Carney, you bring the donuts. <laughs> you can do both. You can do both, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Yeah, you're right, Tim. Janice is getting greedy. <laughs>